Hello, and welcome to Ask an Archaeologist. I'm Nico Tripsevich, the host of today's show. Ask an Archaeologist is a series of live streamed interviews co hosted by the Archaeological Research Facility and the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology at UC Berkeley. Each day at noon on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we will interview a UC Berkeley archaeologist and answer audience questions. If you have a question to, to ask our speaker, please go to uh, Slido and type in Ask Arf. And, uh, and you can type your question and I'll ask it of our speaker. So today we are pleased to host Lucy Gill. She is a PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology at UC Berkeley. Her research sits at the intersection of anthropological archeology span and historical ecology. Tracing animal, human animal relations sedimented within the aquatic ecosystems of Central America. She currently co directs Darien Profundo, a community based collaborative project that takes a deep history approach to a region that often problematically is portrayed as a primeval gap. Welcome, Lucy. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, we'd love to hear about your work. Um, can you tell us about what you're doing in? Central America? Absolutely. Let me share my screen so you guys can have some visuals. Can you see it? Yes. Great. Good. All right. Um, so as Nico mentioned, my project is entitled Darien Profundo. Um, this actually comes from an interview with one of my local collaborators who was describing uh, the rich nature of the province and the deep history that this area has. Um, it, this project is co-directed by my collaborator from Leiden University, Natalia Donner, as well as another collaborator from the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, Tomas Mendizabal, and myself. Um, and we have partnerships so far with eight different communities and uh, one more that we might be um, adding, which I'll talk about at the end of the talk today. Um, all right, so just to give you a sense of where we are geographically, um, the project is situated within Eastern Panama. So uh, over here on the little uh, inlaid map. Um, and as Nico mentioned, my project really is more of a historical ecology project that uses archaeological methods than it is um, sort of more traditional archaeology. Um, and because of that, we're actually focusing on a particular ecosystem um, rather than what you might have heard of a particular like culture, um, culture area, these kinds of things. Um, so my research focuses uh, in the Gulf of San Miguel. The entire watershed basically. So um, this river here is called the Rio Tuira and it feeds into um, the Gulf of San Miguel. And as Nico also mentioned in my introduction, um, this area has really been considered all of Darien province, which is more than a third of what is now Panama, um, has really been considered this gap. Um, you might have heard of the Darien gap or Darien gap in sort of gringo uh, pronunciation. Um, and that it's it's so-called just because it is the only gap in the Pan American Highway that stretches from Alaska all the way to Tierra del Fuego. Um, and that gap exists because indigenous groups in this area um, do not want the highway to be built through their territory. So um, indigenous land sovereignty is something that I'm working a lot on, which will come back throughout this talk. Um, so that's really the only reason, though, that it's considered this gap or and that it's often referred uh, that way in the news. Um, in fact, though, it's uh, not a gap in any other sense. Um, it has this incredibly deep, rich history. Um, it's a biodiversity hotspot. Um, and actually, so uh, the Spanish first settled, this was the site of the first Spanish settlement um, in the mainland. Um, of all of the Americas was in Darien. Um, oh. And actually, uh, they wrote when, when Balboa landed here, um, he wrote that over 1 million people were living in the province. So um, a pretty actually densely occupied area for the time. Um, now there's only about 48,000 people that live within the province. So, um, you know, today it might be considered underpopulated. Certainly that has not always been the case. 
Um, so that's one of the things that we're going to look at. Um, this also just fun fact, uh, when Balboa discovered the Pacific Ocean, um, he discovered the Gulf of San Miguel right here. Um, mm -hmm. So in 1513. So you might have heard of that event. Um, that's where my research is taking place. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very interesting. Are you very, are you close to the Panama Canal? I see something up to the left. Um, so not exactly very close. So um, I, can you see my cursor? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. So the Panama Canal is is about here, mm -hmm. um, and I'm down here. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's about a five hour drive. Um, oh, mm -hmm. it's about a five hour drive, uh, and then a. a bit of a boat ride up river from the Panama Canal. But interestingly, um, the United States uh, through what's called what's called Project Plowshare, which existed from the late 50s through the mid 70s, um, they actually planned to dredge or excavate a second Panama Canal, um, this time with nuclear excavation oh um, using nuclear weapons left over from World War II. Uh, and that was going to be created actually directly through this Gulf. Oh. Um, so luckily, <laughs> Vietnam sure. got in the way. They didn't end up going through with that. Um, and now this area is considered, uh, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, the Parque Nacional de Darien, uh, because of the many endemic species that are there. Um, so not only would we have you know, forcibly relocated many people that live there, including uh, several indigenous communities. Um, we also would have destroyed one of the world's uh, most important places for uh, biodiversity. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that's just sort of a brief intro to the area. Um, the other thing I should say about it is that it is very diverse in terms of the uh, contemporary inhabitants of the area. So there are three different indigenous groups that live um, within Darien province. Um, the Embera, who are the group that I work most closely with or have so far, um, the Wunan and the Kuna. Um, there are also many Afro-descendant communities that have lived in the region, some of them since like the 1600s. Um, and then there are also many uh, what locals call interioranos, um, so people of sort of Latino descent. Mm -hmm. um, and so my impetus for getting involved in this particular area was um, I was invited to be part of a ongoing collaboration between ecologists from the Universidad Tecnológica de Panama in Panama City mm -hmm. um, and several communities in Darien who are working to uh, protect this ecosystem called the Laguna de Machu Saragati, um, which you can see here. It's basically a giant wetland. Um, it's about 68,000 hectares. Um, and although about 28,000 of those hectares are technically protected areas legally, um, there has been a lot of illegal farming. And even um, it's estimated that about 6,000 of the protected 28,000 have even been illegally sold um, mm -hmm. to industrial agribusiness mostly palm oil agriculturalists and rice agriculturalists. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a big problem because for rice agriculture, you need a lot of water. So they're basically diverting water from these wetlands um, into rice fields, um, both within the wetlands and elsewhere, um, which has dramatically reduced the, lowered the groundwater um, and has prevented basically this connection that exists between the wetlands and the Rio Tuira, which I showed you in the previous picture, that giant river. Mm -hmm. um, the connection between the wetland and the river is very important because um, otherwise the salinity of the river will be too high. And so um, they're very concerned that because of this water diversion, um, that's gonna be a problem, not just for the many species and humans that rely on this wetland, but also for the many species and humans that rely on the river system. Mm -hmm. um, so there have been a lot of protests about this in the country, as you can see. Um, this basically says like, you know, stop the draining. Um, and this is like 50,000 hectares are being eyed for by agribusiness, um, by oil palm agribusiness. Mm -hmm. um, so this is sort of an ongoing fight and, um, 
it's very serious to the extent that uh, one very outspoken journalist and environmental activist had to flee the country because she was getting so many death threats um, for this activism. So um, they have been working this ecological team on documenting the contemporary ecological diversity um, of these wetlands, as well as the, their various importances to, for uh, people today in the area. Um, mm -hmm. And I am sort of contributing, along with my collaborators, the paleoenvironmental component of that. Um, mm -hmm. So you can see here just some of the methods that we're using. Um, on the left is Juan Carlos and Indra. Those are uh, a couple of the UTP team members. Um, and they're launching a drone from our boat um, to do some overall drone mapping of the area. Um, we've been doing this, or I should say they're doing this every uh, few months to monitor this ongoing um, illegal destruction um, as, best, as best we can. Um, mm -hmm. In the middle, this is a piezometer which measures the groundwater so um, that we can actually quantify those shifts in um, and how much water is being illegally diverted from this mm -hmm. ecosystem. Um, and then on the right is me um, in taking a sediment core to actually look at um, the changing paleo environment. So um, we're looking at things like seeds, we're looking at pollen, um, phytoliths, um, we're looking at charcoal to look for episodes of burning, these kinds of things, um, erosion, deforestation. Um, we're looking specifically at uh, agricultural practices, which we can um, look at from a soil core by proxy. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, and we, yeah, we have pretty good evidence that there's maize agriculture in this area, at least going back to 2000 BCE. Mm -hmm. So about 4,000 years ago. Um, can, so, can I ask, um, when, when it was maize agriculture, do you have evidence that they were clearing the land for the maize? Uh, yes, I mean, in, in sort of localized areas. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be a large scale clearing operation. Um, but certainly, yeah, you do see evidence of um, what you would call slash and burn agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, but again, in sort of delimited areas, so which which corresponds pretty well with um, contemporary practices, at least among the Embera, which is, you know, that you keep a sort of cleared area for agriculture, but right next to that is an area that you specifically, you know, conserve for things like hunting, um, so, so they really manage to cultivate a variety of ecosystems within um, their territory. Mm -hmm. And that's what we imagine to have also been the case in, the, in that time. I see. Um, well, let me take this moment to um, remind our viewers that they can send questions to Lucy Gill, our guest here, by going to this web page. I've got it printed out here, slido slash askarf. And you can post a question there and I'll uh, send it on to Lucy. Thank you. Thanks, Nico. Um, so yeah, the, just to give you a sense of some of the methods that we're using, um, these don't necessarily look like archaeology as you might have imagined it, digging holes. Um, we actually haven't gotten to the digging holes part yet uh, in this project. This project was only started in January of 2019. Um, so we're really in more of the uh, ecological sampling slash uh, survey phase. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you next some photos from survey. Um, so just this is just a cool image. Um, mm -hmm. This is a boulder covered with what we call petroglyphs. Um, so rock art uh, that is located in contemporary uh, Embera, what's called Tierra Colectiva. So um, basically collectively held lands by the community. Um, and I just like this particular image because I think it's very beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. But what's uh, this date up here is the oldest date that we have so far um, based on radiocarbon dating from the project. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, about 1200 BCE. Um, so about 800 years later than the earliest evidence so far of ag maize agriculture, um, but still pretty early on. 
Um, and I'm showing you this petroglyph instead of the site that the state came from, just because it's a more fun image. Um, but uh, then the site was buried, so there's not really a lot visible on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, not really much to show, but uh, we definitely hope to um, excavate that site we were supposed to this summer. Obviously, field plans are on hold at the moment, as you might imagine, um, but that's sort of one of the first uh, steps on our agenda coming up. Mm -hmm. um, so as I mentioned, right, this project is really seeking to construct this deep sort of time history of the region. Um, so this is our earliest archaeological date. We, of course, have ecological history going back further um, at this point. And then just to give you a sense, as I mentioned, this was a, an important area for uh, Spanish colonial history as well. So here are three different Spanish forts um, that we've encountered so far on survey. Um, and then we're also very much working with contemporary community members, um, not just on the ecological side of things, but also on the archeological side of things. Um, so here is my co-director Natalia Donner um, with one of our local collaborators. Um, and they are chatting about, this is Don Emilio, they're chatting about um, clay procurement. So he's a potter, he still makes ceramics um, in his community and he is uh, showing us many of the sources that he goes to to get that clay, um, which we took samples from so that we can see whether or not those sources have also been used in the archaeological record, um, whether they're different, similar, et cetera, as well as whether the actual techniques of potting have changed uh -huh. over time. So you, you hope to be able to link them with petrography? Yes, exactly. Between the two, between the sources and then the... the the ancient pots as well. Exactly. Yeah. So that's the idea, which um, we had some good success with on the previous project that uh, Natalia and I worked together on in Nicaragua. Um, mm -hmm. So we hope to be able to replicate that here. And um, we also in that in that project, we made a documentary about contemporary uh, potting practices. And so we would like to do something similar as well for this area, um, not just focusing on pottery, but focusing on that as one element of these sort of um, change and continuity in the region. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have a question here from the right. slide O from the web page. Um, somebody is asking, do you know how that, that petroglyph the rock art was created, what sort of tools were they using? Um, that's a great question. Um, we, you know, we don't exactly know. Um, stone tools, certainly, there was, uh, there was metal in this area, but um, purely for sort of artisanal purposes, um, you find things like uh, gold, jewelry, um, but the, there was no sort of um, metallurgical industry that would have been used for construction or anything. Um, mm -hmm. So probably sort of like an anvil hammer type thing um, is what we're thinking, which is very impressive given sort of the sinuous nature of these lines, right? Mm -hmm. um, this certainly would, and, and they're quite deep too, these incisions. Um, it might be a little hard to see in the photo, but some of them are, you know, a couple centimeters deep even. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that would have taken some, some considerable labor. Yeah, factoring in erosion, they were probably even deeper. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. And so it's at, it's at least 12, or at no older than 1260 BCE. Is well, so the petroglyph, this is a very misleading slide for which I apologize. This is the oldest date we have so far in the entire survey area. Mm -hmm. um, the petroglyph we, Petroglyphs are notoriously difficult to actually date because mm -hmm. oftentimes they're located in areas that are um, sort of maybe ceremonially important or mm -hmm. uh, important within the landscape, but not necessarily where there was habitation or extensive activity that leaves archaeological evidence. So therefore, um, you know, the, the dating is always going to be, or usually at least, is going to be um, very indirect. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we do plan to excavate near it to try and get some sort of idea of when it might have been created. Mm -hmm. uh, but truly, like I a lot of people, most of the dates that are associated with petroglyphs, at least in Central America, are pretty much based on wild speculation. So um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to speculate when 
um, this is from, but, but yes, it would be safe to say that probably it is no older than this date, since this mm -hmm. is the earliest date for the entire zone. Mm -hmm. And maybe stylistically, there's a connection. To yeah, um, everyone that I've showed this to who has worked in Panama has never seen anything like it. So oh. um, yeah, we really don't know at this point. Um, I think our best bet is going to be like hoping that some test pits near it turn something mm -hmm. up that can be dated. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, if anyone okay. has any suggestions, let me know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in addition to looking, working with contemporary potters, we are also, and this is more of my research focus, the ceramics are more uh, Natalia's uh, MO, but um, so I'm looking a lot at uh, shell, shell use over time. Um, the, in the background here, you can see this is an archeological shell midden, although people still are dumping refuse there today. So um, it's actually a very good record of uh, what I'm talking about, these like changes and continuities over a very, very long time scale. Um, we don't, we unfortunately don't have a date for the first deposition here yet. Um, that's also something that this is also going to be one of our first uh, excavations. But mm -hmm. um, you can see these other two photos uh, on the top right, you can see this is a contemporary shell midden outside of a house. So people are still very much engaging in these uh, you know, shell midden building practices, um, often very near to their uh, residence, which also was very common in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the bottom right, you can see shells being laid down as a pathway to the door. Um, mm -hmm. These photos, all three of these photos are from a community called Garachine, which is on the coast. Um, and here we're really working um, specifically on issues related to like um, sea level rise uh, and cl sort of climate, other climate change related issues. So um, we're looking at the changing species compositions um, we're looking at the changing dimensions of shells and doing interviews as well with um, contemporary inhabitants of the area to see like what species, you know, used to be there that are now no longer there, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Have they gotten smaller over time? Have they stayed the same size? Um, how are you harvesting? What seasons are you harvesting in? Um, these kinds of things. And then we also plan to do some isotopic research to also look at things like seasonality, um, temperature, et cetera. Um, but this community actually has had to relocate three times within the past, I think only 50 years because of sea level rise. Um, uh. It's a very sort of gradual slope. Um, there's no sort of steep embankment that prevents the sea from encroaching. And so mm -hmm. um, not only is this very disruptive for the community, obviously, but also um, it's very destructive for archaeological sites. Um, right. So we're uh, trying, obviously, again, we can't go right now, but um, this is definitely sort of at the forefront of our agenda because of that. Mm -hmm. um, we, have, we have a couple of more questions here. Uh, first of all, somebody mentioned that maybe the rock, the, the petroglyph was a kuna design, possibly. Um, that's definitely something we're considering. That's, so that's one of the indigenous groups that lives within uh -huh. this area. Uh -huh. And then the other question or comment question was, have you worked on other non-collaborative archaeological projects? And if so, what do you see as the benefits and challenges of working in a collaborative context? That is a phenomenal question. Um, yes, I have definitely worked on many, I would say, uh, not even just non-collaborative, but I, what I found to be sort of problematic uh, projects in terms of their relations with local communities. Mm. Um, in terms of challenges, I guess the only real challenge that I can see, and I don't see this as a negative at all, but I guess you might see it as a challenge um, just in terms of working within sort of normative academic timeframes, you know, granting cycles, tenure, et cetera, um, finishing a dissertation, all of these things, um, is that, you know, you do sort of have to move at the speed of the community. So um, there are certain things like the shell middens that like the community sees, oops, 
the community sees um, this sort of problem that these sites are being destroyed and they want it dealt with as soon as possible. There are also many other instances where communities, um, for whatever reason, you know, you have to build trust, obviously, right? Um, you have to, uh, you know, go through like very, you, you want to involve as many sort of stakeholders within the community as possible. So um, that means having a lot of meetings, not just with like national leadership, um, technically to excavate in Panama, I only need a permit from the National Instituto de Cultura. I technically mm -hmm. don't need even permits from um, local communities unless it's within um, specific indigenous uh, categories of, of land holdings. But mm -hmm. technically that is the legal, um, you know, that is the, the law. Um, obviously mm -hmm. I, don't believe that that should be the law. And I believe that um, local collaboration is, is not only the only ethical option, but also um, the most fruitful. And so um, it's, I mean, in this particular project, I have, as I mentioned, I was sort of invited in as the archeological perspective to this pre-existing community collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, so they have been working in this area for like 20 years and have built up these, um, you know, very deep bond of trust. If I had gone in, you know, from scratch, not having any connections, mm -hmm. that definitely would not have been my experience. Mm -hmm. um, but I think like, A, you know, it's better to find a project where you, your skills can actually be of use um, and mm -hmm. where you are invited in. Um, and uh, so I, but I definitely had that advantage. Um, and, uh, but in terms of the, the overwhelming uh, pros of doing a collaborative project, um, the, you know, all of the contemporary perspectives that you get from just chatting with community members. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, not to mention the amazing, you know, personal relationships that you build, um, but just speaking from sort of a data perspective, um, mm -hmm. people often, I think, have the idea that yes, okay, that might be like the more ethical option, but in terms of data, like it's really all the same, or that might even be collaborative projects might um, produce in some ways, like less systematic data is, is sometimes what people tend to think. Mm. Um, but I mean, if you are not collaborating, you're not going to get any of those uh, contemporary perspectives on practices, um, which are crucial for addressing at least, you know, my research questions. Mm -hmm. um, and so the quality of the data has been significantly improved. Yeah, and so you, you can, can work mm -hmm. on things like that actually have real, you know, use for contemporary communities, which, you know, mm -hmm. shape your research questions. Yeah, so like the antiquity of these, of these shell harvesting and, and the shell middens and if that practice continues, you can learn from the the contemporary people. Um, in fact, we have a question about that. Can you tell the size of the shell midden from the size of the shell midden how many people were living at the site? Mm, that's a good question. So um, the shell midden on the surface is about 50 meters by 50 meters. It's quite large. Uh, we have not though excavated it yet. And so mm -hmm. in order to make any sort of population assessment, we would definitely have to first excavate and then get actual radiocarbon dates so that we could see, you know, how over how much time has this shell midden accumulated. Mm. Um, because just to make an assessment from the surface, um, yeah, we have no way of knowing whether these were all, you know, synchronic occupations or whether there were, you know, diachronic um, occupations that are also visible on both mm -hmm. visible on the surface. And does it they gradiate into the vegetation probably? So it's probably hard to tell exactly where the edges are. If, yeah, that you know. as well. And and certainly again, we don't know exactly how deep it is. Mm -hmm. um, some of these that have been excavated elsewhere in the country, um, but very you know nearby, um, are you know five ten meters deep. So wow. yeah, it's very deep. Yeah. Um, and it, I imagine when you live in a in a wet environment, it, it provides a good dry surface for living and walking on. Um, I've thought about that with the Bay Area shell middens 
on the coast, we have these mud flats. And if you're if you're not on on a dry on a draining area, then you're in the tidal mud flats, mm -hmm. at least here. So this this provides sort of a, a, a draining surface. It'd be a better environment to live on. So you're essentially producing your your living surface through the harvest there. Yeah. Yeah, no, and then certainly it's very similar. Um, so these are uh, the, the ecosystem here um, is like mangrove and, and mud flat area. So mm -hmm. actually very similar. Yeah. Great. Well, we have uh, just a couple more minutes. Uh, cool. Um, some time here. Yeah, just th these are, um, as I was mentioning, right, the sort of pros of collaborative archaeology are um, these partnerships with contemporary communities and um, the things that you can can learn from them about their practices. So I'm working with fishermen um, mm -hmm. as well as hunters. Um, this is Antonio, one of our uh, collaborators from an Embera community. Um, and he's a hunter as well as has a lot of botanical knowledge. Um, and then here's me with a, a pre-Hispanic point. Mm -hmm. um, and just to, to close up, um, because I'm very excited about this, um, uh, just this week, I was invited to be a part of a new community partnership um, based on this law that was passed just in November of 2019 that allows uh, Indigenous communities to file um, land claims, even for areas that are within national parks. Uh -huh. And so I've been invited to be a part of this uh, partnership to provide archaeological evidence for um, you know, continuity uh, of traditional practices. Um, and this is a site that's a little bit closer than where I am now to the Colombian border. So uh -huh. wow. Congratulations. another example of cool things that uh, you can do when you partner with communities. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so let's see, there's, um, uh, let's see, do you, is, are there more slides or? Nope, that's it. <laughs> okay, oh, well, that's wonderful. You're, Part of this this new agreement, um, I know that's contentious in some areas that the parks are exclusive to to non productive activities. Um, well, thank you, Lucy. That was very interesting. Thank um, you for having me. Yeah, and I wanted to thank the listeners and viewers who sent in questions. And I want to invite everyone to the next Ask an Archaeologist talk that will be tomorrow at noon. That's May 6th, Wednesday, May 6th. And we're gonna have Jordan Jacobs of the Hearst Museum and the author of the Samantha Sutton book series uh, presenting on tombs, bats, adventure, and real science. So please join us. And thanks again, Lucy, for taking the time to talk to us. Yeah, thank you, Nico. Mm -hmm.